I would like to uh, introduce Dr. John Harrington or Commander Harrington <clears throat> tonight for our event, uh, Conversation with Astronaut John Harrington. And um, I'm very proud to make this announcement. Um, very proud to be working with our group of schools that partnered in, in Kayla Murphy, who had a vision to, to bring Dr. Harrington into our lives for a few moments tonight and share his knowledge and um, as an indigenous person who, who climbed to the rank of commander and, and, and went into space. And he's gonna tell us all about that. So my name is Sean Hooker. I'm from Wapal Island First Nation, Bikesranong Territory. I am the Indigenous Student Success Coordinator at Lambton College. And I'd like to say welcome to any of you students out there in your educational journey. And hopefully tonight's discussion will uh, make you imagine and consider careers in the STEM, in mathematics, engineering, um, and there's all areas of imagination that you can go. And um, thank, thanks again, uh, Commander Harrington, for sharing your story tonight. And just a little housekeeping to let you know, um, the chat mode is enabled for our participants. And we will get to your questions, well, as many as we can tonight. Um, and then, oh, and finally, it is being recorded. And it will be available through Fanshawe College in the coming weeks, if you want to go back and watch this. Um, and I believe that's all. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Muriel Sampson from St. Clair College and Jimmy Gwetch, and we'll see you in a, in a bit. Miigwech, Sean. Bujo, Muriel Sampson, Dijnikas, Bekedranong Dunjiba, Makwadodam. Hello, my name is Muriel Sampson, and I am the Indigenous Counselor at St. Clair College. I would like to thank everyone for being here today. And I would also like to thank St. Clair College Student Representative Co Council, Lambton College's Indigenous Student Center, Fanshawe College's Institute of Indigenous Learning, the University of Windsor's Turtle Island Aboriginal Education Center, and Western University's Indigenous Student Center for partnering with St. Clair College's Indigenous Student Services. Headphones on so, it, so you can go. We will begin with Kayla's introduction and reading of our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Mariel. Bujou, Kaylin and Dijnikaz, Bekejanan and Nunjiba, Mijikane and Dodum. Hello, my name is Kayla, and I am the Indigenous Learner Advisor at St. Clair College. St. Clair College would like to recognize and acknowledge that it sits on the Three Fires Confederacy's traditional territory of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations. We would also like to acknowledge the many other tribes and Indigenous nations that call this beautiful land home. We give thanks to the land and surrounding water for sustaining us. I will now hand it over to John. Hey. Hi, Kayla. Kayla, thank you much. Uh, Chukumwa. Hello, Sahocha Folat. Uh, my name is John Harrington at Chikasha Seah. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma, and it is my incredible privilege uh, and honor to be with you today. I've had fun just having a chit chat with everybody, uh, the participants here at the beginning of this. And I look forward to uh, kind of sharing a story. You know, uh, I, I kind of find myself as a storyteller now uh, to really talk about my journey uh, to become an astronaut because when I was a little kid, I was eight years old, I used to sit in a cardboard box and dream I was going to the moon. And I, I really, but I never really pursued it. It was something I thought that I would, uh, you know, I dreamed about it because we were doing that in the 1960s. And it wasn't until much later in my life uh, that I'd met certain people and I had done certain things in my life that I found that this path to the astronaut corps was something that was not just a dream, but something was achievable. So I wanna share that story and, uh, and talk about my journey. I'll talk about the space flight a bit. And also I'll talk about what I've done since because um, you know life is not, uh, is not static, it's dynamic. Uh, you may do different things in your life accomplish a certain goal and then uh, go on and do something else because we just can't sit back and, and rest on on one thing we've done. We need to keep uh, keep moving on. So um, that's my story. Thank you so much, St. Clair College and other colleges that are involved in this. Uh, and I'm looking forward to us uh, doing some questions and answers uh, when I'm done. I am at your convenience uh, and your disposal. So uh, we'll go as long as, uh, as you guys want and I'm happy to do that. So. Uh, first off, let me, uh, I'm going to share my screen. I should be a co-host here and I'm going to pull up a presentation here. And let's see, I might look for a thumbs up. Kayla, can I get a thumbs up to see? Can you see it? Awesome. All righty. Well, uh, once again, my name is Dr. John Harrington. Um, we'll talk about the doctor part of it later. 
I'm a retired uh, commander of the United States Navy. I was a, oh, I was a uh, retired as a ca captain, uh, but I hadn't been a captain long enough. And the Navy said, oh, you're commander. So I'm a retired commander of the United States Navy, uh, astronaut certainly, and my mission was STS-113. Uh, the little kid with her glasses is me. Uh, I wanted to be cool when I grew up. I didn't realize that uh, if you can consider being an astronaut cool, it's kind of fun. Uh, the guy in the suit, the extravehicular mobility unit, in the middle picture there is me. I signed a, that picture for a young man once and he looked at it and he goes, this isn't you, this guy's really young. So, okay. Uh, the other guy's uh, the other guy's me as well, a little bit older, but then uh, we may change our appearance. Uh, we're still the same person. And so this is what it is now. I live in the mountains here uh, and uh, outside of Kalispell, Montana. This is my, my uh, sled dog, Emmy, and she's part Canadian Eskimo dog. So uh, yeah, thank you guys. <laughs> she's a good pup. Um, this is a gentleman named Steve Smith, uh, who was an astronaut. No, this is Joe Tanner, actually. It's a friend of mine. And uh, an astronaut named Steve Smith uh, gave us a, was in a class one day when we were first selected, and he wrote a really large number on the board. And he said, in the history of the human race, we estimate about 108 billion people have lived on the surface of the Earth. And I think these numbers are correct now. As of today, uh, and this number's gotten bigger quicker recently, uh, 596 people have had the privilege of flying in space. That's going above 100 kilometers or 62 miles um, above the Earth. So 596 people have had the privilege of flying in space. And Steve reminded us, he said, never forget how fortunate you are to do something that so very few people in the history of the world have ever done. And it behooves you to share that story with others. And so that's why I tell the story. It comes from the heart. Uh, I gave a talk once and I, I read a speech. And every time I looked up from the speech, this guy in the back of the room, a native guy, um, was a writer and storyteller. He kept doing this, and I didn't know what that meant. And what he said, he said, speak from the heart. You know, tell the story. You know, it's here. Tell us that story. So I hope this comes across that is, uh, is certainly coming from my heart. Of the 596 people, uh, 244 of us have had the privilege of hopping in a spacesuit and stepping outside of the spacecraft or walking on the surface of the moon. And I was kind of curious. Uh, I'm the 143rd person in the history of the human race uh, to actually step outside of a spacecraft into the vacuum of space, uh, wearing a suit and doing some pretty productive work. Um, you know, a lot of folks say, John, you know, what's it like on the moon? I, um, I didn't go to the moon. Um, I was, I think 12 years old, the last time anybody went to the moon. Uh, uh, 24 uh, citizens of the world have actually had a privilege of flying in space and going to another body in our solar system to the moon. Of that 24 people, 12 have actually worked on the surface of the moon. And I've been privileged in my career to the people the, to watch the people that I watched as a kid now became my colleagues. I'm very good friends with uh, General Tom Stafford who flew on Apollo 10. Also went to, uh, he went to the surface of the moon but didn't quite land. He was in mission right before uh, Apollo 11. Uh, and then John Young was commander of Apollo 16. Uh, he sat across the table from me and asked me why I wanted to work for him. So I've been privileged in my career uh, to work with the people I looked up to as a kid. And uh, I'm very fortunate uh, to have that, had that experience in my life. My journey started in Oklahoma. I'm a uh, citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, uh, uh, Chickasaw. Uh, this is my great grandmother, Bina Underwood, my grandpa, uh, Cub Obishan Owens, my brother, the big tall kids, my brother. Um, I did not grow up in Oklahoma. I was a citizen of Chickasaw Nation, always been very proud of my heritage. Uh, on my mom's side of the family, that's where our lineage to the Chickasaw Nation comes from. Uh, I wish I'd had the opportunity to grow up and have a chat with my grandma, my granny, um, often because she spoke the language fluently. But at that time in uh, our lives, she didn't speak it to accept anybody but people her own age. For, for whatever reason, she felt it was it would behoove us to not learn the language. And I, I regret not having had the chance. I certainly, as I've gotten older and my tribe is, uh, I'm very involved with my tribe um, and very proud of that fact. So I'm learning as much as I can, but uh, we moved a lot as a kid. When I um, moved from Oklahoma when I was about a year old, uh, we were involved in aviation. My mom and dad liked airplanes. This is my mom and I in a air show in Colorado, Colorado Springs way back in the day. I think I'm like six years old. Um, my dad was a pilot. And he let me fly in airplanes with him. I took for granted the fact that I had a chance to fly airplanes. I thought everybody got to fly airplanes. You don't realize how fortunate you are when it's something so close to you. Um, we also used to shoot rockets off. This is my dad, my brother, the little, little kid on the left is me. Uh, there's a rocket between me and my dad. 
And on the top of that rock, it's a little payload. And I used to take the top of the payload off and I'd grab a little beetle out of the grass and I'd stuff it into the top of the payload and I'd put the lid on it and I'd, I'd shoot the thing off and beetle would come out, you know, and I'd watch it, see what it did. And, and I, I don't think the beetles liked me very much, but um, it was fun. I was experimenting, you know, doing the thing that kids do. Uh, but I was always interested in aviation and, and rocketry. And, and like I said early, I used to sit in a cardboard box and dream I was going to the moon. And, and it, uh, it took uh, much later in my life. I graduated from high school in 1976. That is my tuxedo and my big hair. Um, I went to college because my parents told me I had to. Uh, they knew that uh, neither of my parents had gone to college at the time. And they knew if I wanted to improve my chances for success in life, I should get an education beyond high school. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I did know, and you tend to change a little bit when you go to college. I did know that I liked to work outside. I didn't want to be behind a desk. I was not interested in, in uh, I, wanted, I wanted to do stuff outside. And I spent most of my time outside because I learned how to rock climb my freshman year. Two guys taught me how to climb and I spent all my time climbing and very little of my time studying. I was totally intrigued with rock climbing and I, I really, I couldn't, I could care less about school. And so unfortunately, when that happens, you don't study. And when you don't study, you don't, you don't pass your tests. I had a 1.72 grade point, had three Ds. I got three Ds over two semesters. And as a freshman in college, I didn't realize as a part-time student, because I was working full-time in a restaurant, because I, you know, I was paying for my education, uh, I got kicked out of school as a freshman. And it wasn't, I like to say, it wasn't because I wasn't intelligent. It wasn't, I wasn't motivated. I didn't have a desire to be in school and I needed to find something that would energize me. And I was very fortunate that as a rock climber, uh, I met a, a friend of mine uh, who gave me a job rock climbing in the mountains of Colorado. And my job as a rock climber was, this is called Glenwood Canyon. This is on what's called Interstate 70. It's a major highway that runs all the way across the United States. And um, this is the only part of that highway that was two lane. And my job as a rock climber was to hang off of the cliffs and hold a piece of glass against the rock because they wanted to measure the what's called the cross section of this canyon because they wanted to put a highway and this highway you see right here above the train is the highway you actually we ended up building but they needed to know how wide the canyon was and the only way to do that was to have a guy hang off of the cliff with a hold a piece of glass against the rock and, and some folks on the ground would had this big box that, that would shoot an infrared beam of light to this piece of glass I held in my hand. And that light would hit the beam, hit the, hit the glass and go right back where it came from. And the computer in the box would measure the time it took. And light travels at a constant velocity, right? So if you know how long it took to go from one point to some point and back again, you can determine how far it is. And if you know the angle of that beam of light, and you can determine how high it is. You can X and Y. So what is this? This is the first time in my life that I saw mathematics in practice. I had never seen math in practice. I'd seen it in a textbook. And I used to scratch my head and go, what does this mean? Like a lot of folks. Well, it's the first time in my life I realized that people were doing this for a living, getting paid to do it. And I had fun. I enjoyed it. And the guy that I worked for convinced me if I wanted to make something of myself, I better get myself back in college and become the engineer be the one responsible for the, uh, the whole project, not just the lowest guy on the rung of the ladder, uh, making $4 an hour. So I went back to college. Um, one, the college let me back in, which was amazing. I hadn't changed my grades. They were still, you know, had a, had a 1.72 grade point, but they gave me another chance. And I, I excelled. I had a motivation. I had some really good friends. And by the time I was a senior, I worked for the math department. And I met a guy who happened to be my student and he used to fly these airplanes. This is called a Dauntless Dive Bomber. He used to fly these in World War II. And this guy was in his 60s, and I was a teacher. I was, his, I was his calculus tutor. And he asked me what I wanted to do when I graduated, and I, I really didn't know. He said, well, why don't you think about joining the Navy? You know, fly airplanes for a living. And I'd done it as a kid, but I never really looked at it as a possibility. And so I realized, you know, ah, that's intriguing. I went and saw a movie uh, called Officer and a Gentleman. And that's what I had to do. I joined uh, what's called uh, Aviation Officer Candidate School in uh, November of 1984, and they shaved off all of my long hair. And uh, about 14 weeks later, I was an officer in the United States Navy. I went on about a year and a half later to get my wings. These, uh, you see the wings here I have on my chest are Navy wings of gold. I flew uh, a large airplane called a P-3 Orion, and I used to hunt submarines. I hunted submarines for about four years all over the Pacific, 
up over the uh, Arctic Ocean uh, along the South Pacific, had a great career. And I realized that at that point in time, that that dream I had as a kid, if I wanted to be an astronaut, I needed to go to test pilot school and I needed to get an advanced degree. And so I applied, um, most of this is the airplane I flew, P3, pretty big airplane, lots of stuff, lots of dials, lots of things in it. I applied to the United States Navy test pilot school in uh, 1989 and I joined um, uh, class of 98, a uh, whole bunch of folks flying uh, airplanes from all across the Navy and the Air Force, uh, folks from Spain, had a guy from Italy, a uh, bunch of great group of folks. I'm in the middle down here, this little young guy right here. All the stuff I'd learned in math in college, I applied to flying airplanes. And I, and I realized that you could define how an airplane flies mathematically. And so it was a great experience for me. Uh, I flew a bunch of things as a test pilot. I flew for the Army, a uh, thing called the Havilland-7, made in Canada. Thank you very much. Uh, the P3 Orion as well, and also what was going to be replacement trainer uh, to the Air Force, the Navy's primary trainer, and I was given a lot of responsibility as a 29-year-old kid to be able to uh, fly a project like this uh, all on my own with an engineer, and I decided to get an um, advanced degree to be competitive to be an astronaut. Uh, they sent me to Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. I earned a Master's of Science degree in Aeronautical Engineering. I applied to NASA twice, and lo and behold, they liked me. They, uh, uh, they selected me in the 16th group of astronauts. I'm way up here in the corner. Uh, there's 35 uh, US and nine and international students. Uh, we had uh, Madame Payette, Gilles Payette right here. Also, Steve McLean is another astronaut from Canada. Steve's a wonderful guy. There's Steve, right? Steve's right next to me up here in the back. Uh, great, great group of folks. Um, we were nicknamed the Sardines because they normally pick about 10 to 15 people. In our class, they picked 35, well, 44, essentially. Largest class ever selected. Um, they nicknamed us the Sardines, so I drew the patch. That little cartoon right there is mine. Uh, one of my classmates came up with a the saying, uh, for, Deans, uh, for Sardines, space is no problem, which is true. Uh, I had the best job in the office. I got to fly in the front seat of the jet. Uh, as a mission specialist, but also had a chance to walk in space. And that was a high point, certainly, of my professional career. My, um, you know, I was, somebody asked me about the patch earlier. I think Sean asked me about the patch. Um, every crew designs their own patch. I was a crew artist. I came up with this patch pretty quickly. Uh, real quickly, the four of us on the solar panels here, Jim Weatherby, Paul Lockhart, myself, Mike lopez Alegria. the only the four of us on a crew because we took three people to space uh, Ken Bowersox, Nick Budarn, and Don Pettit, and we brought back two Russians, uh, Larry Korzun and Sergei Trustjev, and brought back Peggy Whitson, an American astronaut, classmate of mine. That was our primary job. Our secondary job was to go outside and install this truss on the left side of the space station. And so uh, that's what we did, CXIII-113, uh, the numeral 113. The commander said it spelled the word sexy. Yeah, okay, so I'm okay with that. <laughs> So don't, sh don't tell NASA, they won't let you put on the patch. We did, there we go, fun stuff. Uh, the four of us on the crew, uh, Jim Weatherby, uh, Paul Lockhart, Mike Lopez Alegria, myself. There's actually six people in this photo because the suits Mike and I are wearing weigh about 300, 300 pounds a piece. How many kilos is that? I'm gonna gotta go back and do that translation. Um, but NASA and their safety culture doesn't want you to get hurt. So they put a guy behind you to hold you up. Um, this was a... The, the guy holding my nose is a gentleman named Gus Loria. He was our original pilot, but had a medical issue and he couldn't fly with us. And so uh, we had an Air Force guy come on board. But, uh, you know, it, it's neat. Neat group of folks having a lot of fun. That young man holding me up in the back is uh, we got his picture. We launched almost 20 years ago, November of 2002. Hard to believe it's time has flown so fast. Uh, it, uh, it's a, a pretty bumpy ride for about eight and a half minutes. It takes eight and a half minutes to get to, from launch pad uh, into orbit. Uh, about over 7 million pounds of thrust are pushing the space shuttle up must via two solid rocket boosters and three main engines. Uh, quite a ride. Uh, this is a great time-elapsed photo. As Sean said, he watched, uh, he watched a launch go up over the coast of the uh, United States once from Daytona. Uh, we go up and around the Earth. We don't go straight up. Uh, because if you went straight up, the engines quit, you come straight back down. Gravity has not gone anywhere. It's still there. It's just you're going so fast, uh, 28, a little over 28,000 kilometers per hour. It's roughly seven and a half kilometers per second. You can imagine how fast that is. Um, and eight and a half minutes later, you're, you're in orbit. 
Uh, we arrived underneath the space station over the island of New Zealand. This is the uh, North and South Island. This, uh, the clouds here cover up a thing called Cook Strait. Uh, James Cook sailed the HMS Endeavor through that strait back in the 1700s. Our spaceship is named after his sailing ship and NASA seems to come up with these really neat uh, um, things to talk about the photo. So space station took this photo of us and we took a photo of them on our arrival. Our job was to install a piece just like the one you see here with the white panels over on what's the left side of space station. It looks like at the right from this vantage point, but it's actually the left side. Uh, we did that with three spacewalks. Mike and I had spent about 20 hours outside. Uh, we handed off uh, the, that big piece. Imagine a school bus uh, being handed off to another, to a robotic arm. So the Canadian uh, SSRMS, Canadian robotic arm, thank you. Uh, you guys did a great job with that. Uh, I had a chance to ride that and we uh, went outside once it was bolted to the space station, the truss, and Mike and I uh, did a whole bunch of things and I'll um, show some pictures of that. But one of the funny stories that I you know, like to tell is that um, things happen in space you don't expect. And that thing happened to me right here at this moment. Uh, as the suit pressure changes, you can feel the pressure on your head uh, and your inner ear and your nose. And so you grab your nose and you, you close your mouth and you equalize that pressure. The same thing when you're in an airplane, you're in a pool, you feel that pressure squeeze. And so you have to grab your nose and then close your mouth and, and valve salva it's called. Well, same thing happens in that suit because of pressure change in the suit. The only problem is you can't grab your nose, right? Tink, tink, tink. You can't, you can't sneak your hand up underneath the helmet. So there's a, a little foam rubber cushion right on the side here. And you actually push your nose on it and you close your mouth and you could, it does the same thing. You equalize the pressure. Well, if you've ever seen somebody drink a glass of milk and then blow it out their eyeball, I can do that. And I found that out because uh, in space, all the liquid in your body is floating. So the liquid in your sinuses is floating. And so when I went to Valsalva, part of that stuff in my sinuses came out of my eye and it stuck to the inside of the helmet. I had three uh, little um, blobs of uh, eye goobers on the inside of my helmet. Nobody told me that would happen. So Mike uh, is watching me from the other side of the airlock laughing at me. And, you know, I, you know, do you, do you tell NASA you have eye goobers in your helmet? You know, do you depressurize a suit, take the helmet off, clean it, put it back on, repressurize. And, and if you do that, it's going to take probably about 30 to 40 minutes to go through that whole process. And, um, and I was told to not be late, you know, do not get out late, do not get out late. So I made a command decision, as we call it in the Navy, uh, to uh, clean my inside of my helmet uh, on my own. And so I just reached up with my lips and went, and I, I slurped off uh, those eye goobers off the inside of my helmet. Um, yeah, well, the Russian goes, John, don't do that, you fog helmet. And yeah, okay, uh, yeah, sure enough, my first spacewalk, I went out and I went, it fogged up the front of my helmet. Uh, but the neat thing about the helmet is the, the suit, the air comes over the, the top of your head and it just defogged it right away. So it wasn't a problem. I did not get sick. It may be gross, but I didn't get sick and I got out on time. So that was what I was trained to do to get out on time. Fun story. A uh, great shot that Mike took of me uh, with the uh, Space Shuttle Endeavor in the background. You'll notice there's not a single star in that picture because the, everything is so bright uh, you can't see the stars, they're so faint, but at night you can really see the stars. But in any photo in the daytime like this, um, you, can't, you can't see the stars. Uh, it takes 90 minutes to go around the earth, okay? So for 45 minutes you're in light, 45 minutes you're in darkness, uh, and it's remarkable. It's a great shot that someone took of Mike uh, with the red stripes taking a photo of me, which is the photo that's right behind me. So this is uh, the ultimate cliff for a rock climber. Uh, 220 miles above the surface of the earth, just a fabulous, fabulous place to be. Uh, uh, amazing. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, here's a fun little video. Um, after we finished all of our work, we had a chance to uh, play with our tools and our food because we had a four day, about a three day vacation coming home because of bad weather. Uh, my kids gave me some pistachios. I like pistachios, shelled pistachios. I wasn't very good at eating them. That's Peggy teaching me how to eat pistachios in space. Boop. It's fun. It's a fun way to play with your food. 
Uh, this is Peggy with a bag of orange drink and uh, a property of a liquid is called surface tension. And that means it's a hard, hydrogen and oxygen are really strong bonds. And in space, it, the, the water forms into a ball and you can play with it with some dental floss. You can get a little energetic here and Paul was a little energetic, uh, but we're highly trained professionals, slurp it up. Uh, this is a chain my commander had around his neck and they said, uh, put in a ball of water, watch what it does. And this is a uh, chain and a, an air bubble in the middle. Uh, Sergey in a sleeping bag, I slept uh, between two bags. I didn't like the feeling of not touching anything. My head right here is actually Velcroed to the pillow, believe it or not. Uh, Peggy slept standing up and then Paul would sleep on the ceiling and, and do a backflip into a sleeping bag, which was pretty, pretty neat. That was great fun. Uh, when we undocked, we took a picture of the piece we installed right here. Uh, this was in 2002. Uh, this is what it looks like now. Uh, we've had over 16 countries, all, all told, involved in the manufacture and assembly of the International Space Station. It's been in orbit since 1999. The first crew went in orbit in the year 2000. So it's been in space for you know almost 22 years. And uh, a phenomenal engineering achievement. We're learning a lot about the human body, how things work, when things don't work in space and the problems that people have with uh, eyesight and some, uh, I just read recently that um, your body destroys red blood cells twice as fast in space as it does on earth, um, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, learning a lot, a European stage part, uh, Japanese part, piece I installed is right here. Uh, and it'll fly for part another, probably another nine years, I, that's what they're saying. Uh, to honor my heritage as a Native American, I took two things to, um, actually two, three things, two things I actually could take out in space. The eagle feather was given to me by an elder with the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, a guy named Phil Lane Sr. Uh, Phil's wife, Bo, was Chickasaw from my tribe. Uh, the flute was made by a Cherokee friend who was an engineer at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, the eagle feathers beaded Mother Earth and Father Sky and all the people of the world. These are now both in the Smithsonian uh, Museum of the American Indian in Washington, DC. The, the, there was also a pot. A friend of mine is a Hopi potter named Al Koyawema. Al is also an engineer, a uh, phenomenal engineer. He used to do a lot of work on inertial navigation systems on one of the very first space planes called the X-15. And he's also a traditional Hopi potter. And he made a pot about this big. This is what, similar to it, it's a big one here, but he put cornmeal in it as, a, as Hopi. And uh, that flew on the space shuttle and it's now in the museum right next to that flute and that feather. Kind of give a really neat perspective about being in space is looking back on where you're from. So I'll share where I'm from. Uh, if you look up the west coast of California through Oregon and Washington, there's Portland. Uh, you can go on up here to Seattle. And uh, this is uh, Victoria. Uh, this is Vancouver Island right here. So Victoria right there and Vancouver right here. Uh, the Canadian Rockies over here. Um, Spokane, Washington, which is about where my daughter lives, and I'm over here uh, in Montana. So me, I'm off the edge of the picture right here. If you've ever been to uh, Montana, I'll give you a quick uh, play around here. Kalispell, Montana is where I live. This is Glacier National Park, Fernie, uh, uh, and it's north of us in Canada. And I live over here in a little teeny place, an airstrip uh, called Marion, Montana. Um, I found a really neat photo that I, this, this is kind of upside down if you imagine, but you guys are in this photo. So uh, if you look here, this is Lake Michigan looking from about the Northeast to the Southwest, Lake Huron over here. You're going to hear to Lake Erie. Uh, Detroit would be about over here. So I believe this is Lake St. Clair, if I believe. And so um, probably uh, St. Clair College right here. So you are right here. So pretty much everybody on this, in, on, in this area, part of uh, Ontario's uh, in this photo. You have folks in British Columbia, we're in the other photo. So uh, it's neat, you're, you know, wave, you're in the picture, yay. Um, I'm gonna look the other way real quick. Um, the Hubble, I think you've heard a, a lot about the Hubble Space Telescope, fundamentally has changed our perspective on ourselves in the universe. And it was launched in 1990 with, a, with they, and unfortunately they didn't test it, there's a problem with the mirror. So when they first turned it on, uh, pictures came back blurry. And the neat thing about the Hubble is we can send up astronauts to fix it, and we did. Um, and we gave it new optics, essentially gave it glasses. Uh, this is a photo of what's called the Eagle Nebula. Some people call it the, the pillars of creation. 
uh, these are tall columns of hydrogen gas and dust. And these are the, this is the place where stars are formed. These are um, uh, you know, gaseous clouds that have a lot of dust. And as the dust gets um, collects on itself, it gets more mass, more mass, more gravity to the point it's so, it's so much gravity, it collapses on itself and it fuses the hydrogen into helium. And we have one of those that's called the sun, our star, our closest star is it doing exactly that. It's so massive, it's fusing the hydrogen to helium, it gives off energy, gives off light. This is a picture of how stars are formed, where they're formed, and it's 7,000 light years from the earth. 7,000 times six trillion miles. This is a long way, it's a 7,000 year old picture. The Hubble is essentially a visual time machine. The picture it sees, this picture right here, took 7,000 years for that light to come from that formation all the way across the uh, universe to the Hubble. Wow, that, that's just, it staggers the imagination. I've got some more to stagger your mind here. This is called the Orion. This is what, you know, some folks call the Orion uh, Nebula. There's a constellation Orion. You see the belt, you can see the shoulders, uh, Betelgeuse, one of the stars. Well, the Ojibwe would look at this and they would call this the uh, Bibun Kiyonini, Kiyonini, I think is how you pronounce it, the winter maker. This is the constellation we see in the winter. So as indigenous people, we can look up at the stars and we, we define them as what we see, what's relevant to our lives. And I think it's really neat to be able to show, you know, how as indigenous people, we can look up and see the same things. We've got stories to go along with those. Um, anything about the Hubble is it's not stationary. It flies around the earth at about 300 some odd miles uh, at about 17,000 miles an hour. And one day a scientist said, let's look at a point in the sky where there's very few stars. Why would, why would he take a telescope and look at where there's no stars? Well, they took about 350 pictures over a 10 day period and they put them all together. And this is what they saw. That place where there were no stars, there's a star in the front here and a star in the front here. If you can imagine looking through an eight foot long soda straw or taking a dime and holding it, you know, you know, Canadian dime or uh, American dime and looking at the end of it, looking at the eye on that dime, that's this picture. There's about 10,000 galaxies in this photo. Not, not just stars, galaxies. So if you take that point and you put it all over the heavens and you multiply it times the number of stars in each galaxy, maybe hundreds of billions of stars, they estimate for every grain of sand on the surface of the earth, there's a star in the visible universe. That's how many stars we believe are out there. And this is about 13 billion light years from the earth. Well, what's that? They believe the Big Bang occurred about 13.72 billion years ago. This is looking back essentially at the beginning of time, space time, close to it. Well, the new telescope called the James Webb, which just got launched, it just unfurled itself and it's on its way out to a point in space or we can't take, we can't service it, but it's gonna look back even farther than this. It's gonna look back at some of the earliest universes, uh, the stars that were ever formed at the, essentially the very beginning of time. Like I say, this is just fun. I think it's amazing to look at something like this and try and imagine, you know, we're not alone in the universe. I get asked all the time, do I believe in aliens? Well, flying saucer aliens, you know, that zip around the earth and hide from us, no. I believe life exists in the universe because the probability is so great given the number of stars out there. You know, why are we so unique when all the stuff we have here, what we are made of, what this earth is made of, our sun is made of, exists in, in the men, tremendous quantities <coughs> out in space. Um, yeah, I think life exists in the universe because of that, that picture, that real, no kidding, honest to goodness picture right there. Okay, back on the shuttle. Um, we were in space for about two weeks. We came home. Um, I couldn't stand up. When we landed, um, I think I was dehydrated, uh, I was nauseated, couldn't stand up, um, threw up a few times. Um, uh, but it took about a week to get used to being back on the earth. Uh, I used to lay in bed at night and I'd look up and I think that was the floor because <laughs> it was, you know, for two weeks of my life. Um, the mission after mine was Columbia. I lost uh, seven friends on Columbia, two, three were my classmates. We didn't fly for about uh, two and a half years. Uh, I was training to be a space station commander uh, to command two Russians, but I was diagnosed with osteoporosis and I got disqualified from flying on the space station. I had a chance to fly the shuttle again, but we weren't flying the shuttle. And some folks approached me in Oklahoma, um, my home state, with the opportunity to be a test pilot on a commercial spacecraft. And I made a really, really tough decision to leave NASA and leave my job early in 2005 
with the notion of being able to, um, you know, to fly a whole new vehicle. Unfortunately, uh, our, we didn't have the money that we, um, we, we should have had to finish it. We won the exact same agreement that SpaceX did. Uh, SpaceX was owned by, you've heard of SpaceX, right? You haven't heard of rocket plane Kistler uh, because we were owned by a millionaire, not a billionaire. Uh, the billionaire, Elon Musk, was able to match the money that NASA gave him. We, we could not raise the money. And so I ended up uh, leaving that company in 2007. And I went to my tribe and I asked the governor of my tribe if he would sponsor me uh, in a journey across the United States, uh, stopping at native schools, uh, Indian reservations, uh, and NASA Explorer schools across the United States from uh, the Macaw Nation, an upper corner of Washington State, all the way down to Cape Canaveral, uh, Florida. I called it Rocket Trek. Uh, and this bike ride fundamentally changed my life. Uh, along the way, uh, my host uh, in Lewiston, Idaho, I proposed to at the end of the bike ride uh, in front of the countdown clock at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, she'd written a book back in the 1990s uh, with a gentleman named Horace Axtell, who was a Nez Perce elder, and Margot Aragon was the woman that wrote that book. I bought that book for my mom back in the 1990s. 2008, I met this woman on a bike ride and fell in love, and Horace, bless his heart, married us uh, in a traditional Nez Perce ceremony in uh, Joseph, Oregon, uh, the traditional homelands of the Nez Perce. Um, uh, this remarkable woman, bless her heart, uh, unfortunately passed away about four years ago from cancer. Uh, she was a uh, educator, uh, English professor, and she encouraged me to write a book uh, called Mission to Space uh, about my journey as a child and growing up and becoming an astronaut. Um, my tribe actually published the book, uh, the Chickasaw Press. I think it's on Amazon. Uh, it's about K through four, K through five, uh, the reader level. My tribe actually has a vocabulary, uh, the Chikasha Numpa, the uh, Chickasaw language in the back uh, takes the words in the book and translates them into Chickasaw. So it's uh, pretty neat. Um, let's see, this is a, this is a uh, video of that bike ride. Saw some weird stuff on the road. It's a Nez Perce gas station. Never saw a moose. Salish Kootenai tribes in the Flathead Reservation here in Montana, just south of me. This was actually painted on the road in the going into a really narrow canyon. Had a pirate on the bike ride. I flew a flag for the Crow Nation and I stopped and gave it back to them on my uh, on my bike ride. Yeah, the snake wasn't happy with me. Met a Chinese lawyer uh, writing a story about Americans. Pretty neat. Guy named, another guy named Aaron. I pedaled with a Chinese lawyer uh, through Colorado. My tribe's headquarters in Ada, Oklahoma. Chief Tishomingo, one of our uh, heroes. Big rattlesnakes in Arkansas, I didn't realize it. Neat spelling too. Across the Mississippi, I have my second flat tire right there.
on to Alabama and Sweet Potatoes. Britney Spears poster here somewhere. There it is. Britney Spears. You should shave your head. Boiled peanuts. I can say that uh, the bike ride, it did change my life. And uh, the reason it was, I ended up um, going back to school and earning a PhD in education in, uh, in Idaho. And one of the things that I did in my work was with native students. And I talked about this fact that you know, as native people, we are engineers, we are scientists. We, you know, in our curriculum, we don't talk about that. Nothing of, uh, I grew, and when I was growing up, they didn't ever tell me that native peoples you know, occupied this land and were incredible engineers and scientists. So this is a place called Monk's Mound in Cahokia, Illinois. This is a civilization that was considered the largest city in North America until Philadelphia. And native people occupied this, probably 20 to 40,000 native people and about 500 to 1,000 in the common era. Um, my tribe came from a place called Moundville, Alabama. And this is the uh, you know, central mound that had the uh, great son of the chief at the top and uh, ceremonial mounds in the distance. These are all built by native peoples you know, over a thousand years ago. And, and I take great pride in the fact that's what my ancestors did. Uh, Mesa Verde, if you've ever been down there, these are, these are buildings that are still standing today that our ancestors built um, you know, years ago. Uh, this is called Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. Uh, there's a thing called the Sun Dagger. This is an astronomical calendar uh, that is built up on a bluff. At a certain, at the summer solstice, the, line, the sun splits a line on the Sun Dagger. And our ancestors did that. They had the, they had the ability to observe the world and that's what I work with students is, you know, we are engineers, we are scientists, we, we are botanists, we're, uh, we're educators, we're storytellers, you know, we have the ability to do remarkable things. And I take great pride in the fact my ancestors gave me the opportunity to walk this earth and to fly above it and to, uh, and to share that story with others. Shortly after my wife passed away, um, I was approached by some folks that made an IMAX movie called Into America's Wild. Uh, with a young Inuit woman, uh, Nupiak, uh, from Uniclete, Alaska, Ariel Tweedo. Got a chance to ride a Corvette. I drove a Corvette down Shiprock in Arizona. We went to Charleston, South Carolina, uh, worked with a bunch of kids talking about native plants um, on the Appalachian Trail with a young woman who had hiked the length of the Appalachian Trail from top to bottom uh, faster than any man or woman had ever done it before. Jennifer Farr Davis, she's the lady in the pink hat right there. And uh, went down to San Antonio as well with a remarkable deaf woman, uh, MFA Rudkin, who works with native works with kids to give them uh, uh, hearing aids and backpacks that you can sense uh, the sounds that are around you. Uh, in through uh, Colorado, uh, Arizona, we had fun. And the movie came out two years ago in Canada. It's called Into Nature's Wild. It's showing in a variety of places. But here's a real quick little video uh, I want to share with you. We were born to explore. From the earliest adventurers to today's modern day trailblazers, our curiosity moves us forward into the great unknown, where a vast and beautiful wilderness is waiting to be discovered. I was chasing down the dream. Like you always start with you. The creators of National Parks Adventure invite you on an exciting journey into the natural wonders of America. Coming on to the place that I Back to the land of my first love. Join astronaut John Harrington and Alaska native Ariel Tweedo as they explore the great outdoors. From ancient homelands and hidden trails to the wilds and our own backyard. Take a step off the beaten path into nature's secret wonders and find out what it means to be at home in the wild. Coming home to the place that I remember.
Freeman's Into America's Wild, a film for IMAX and Giant Screen Theater. And Morgan Freeman says my name. Woo, that's pretty cool. Now, it, it, like I say, in Canada and uh, outside the United States, it's called Into Nature's Wild, and it's uh, big screen IMAX theaters. And I looked it up earlier where it might be showing into America's Wild or into nature's wild.com. And if you pull it up, you'll see uh, the theaters where it's showing in Canada. Um, Harriet Tubman, bless her heart, was an escaped slave uh, and uh, helped run the Underground Railroad and help people make their way up uh, into Canada around Niagara, across the Niagara River. Um, and she also um, uh, was supposed to replace Andrew Jackson on a $20 bill here in the United States. And that's good because Andrew Jackson, I don't like, he kicked my tribe out of the United States back in the 1800s on the Trail of Tears. Uh, so I'm not fond of Andrew Jackson. I'm very fond of Henry Tubman. And she said this back in the 1800s, and I think it's very prophetic. Every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember you have the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars and to change the world. And I know for a fact that if I hadn't listened to people in my life that encouraged me to do something that I didn't think I could do, um, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And so uh, I'm very fortunate I get a chance to share the story with you. And, and I hope it's, uh, it's thought, gives some very thought provoking things. If you have some questions and answers, um, I would love to be able to uh, answer as many as I can. I think I'm within the time frame, but I hope you enjoyed that. And I'll, I'll pass it back to y'all and you, uh, you throw them at me, I'll do my very best. How about that? Yeah, sounds good. Thank you so much. Um, we have, looks like quite a, quite a few questions. You can type your questions into the question and answer um, tab and uh, Brian Malott and I will read them. Um, Brian and I both work at Fanshawe College in the Institute of Indigenous Learning. Um, I will start. The first question is from Jason. He's wondering what is the best post-secondary path or choices a 20 something can take in order to get into the space field? Uh, it's, it's a technical degree. You know, it gives something, a, you know, technical degree, engineering, uh, you know, you know, some science background is be very analytic. Um, you know, we have uh, we have educators that were a, a selected the astronaut corps, but they were science teachers. Uh, there were folks that if, if you can do something in your and in, in, it helps to have an advanced degree. You know, bachelor's is great. Get a master's because you're compete with people that have have masters and PhDs. Um, you don't have to be in the military to do it. I know folks like Steve McLean is a very good friend of mine from Canada. Uh, you know, uh, you know, obviously uh, Chris Hadfield and a few others um, that uh, you know went through military route. On a Chris's military Canadian Air Force, I believe, uh, was a test pilot at Pax River, Maryland, when I was there. Um, you know, get a technical degree. Uh, something. If you look at what NASA is doing, think about um, in the long term. You know, uh, you know, astrophysics, uh, geology. You know, if we go to back to the moon and go to Mars someday. What are those type of things you can do that would benefit NASA in their in their goals? So, uh, but uh, get a technical degree. Awesome, thanks, Brian. Do you want to ask the next one? Yeah, thanks. So the next question comes from Jamie. Uh, what would you say was the most interesting thing about your training becoming an astronaut? The most interesting thing, <laughs> being in the simulator all the time. You know, we uh, there's so many things that can go wrong with the space shuttle and we have this devious group of instructors that can sit in another room and they think up of all the different types of scenarios failure scenarios uh, that can occur on launch in orbit uh, on re-entry and so as a member of the flight crew i sat as a flight engineer you know i sat on the flight deck between the commander and the pilot and then we go uphill you know on launch and then they would just throw just numerous malfunctions at us and so that was the one thing that you really got good at. You really got good at knowing the systems. You had to know the systems really well, not just know the checklist because you have to know what's behind the checklist. You have to know why you're throwing that switch or, you know, what the next worst failure is. And, and so I think that was the most interesting thing about it. And also training in the pool uh, to do the spacewalks. You know, the only way you can actually do the best way to simulate weightlessness is to be neutrally buoyant in the water. And uh, Buzz Aldrin, the second man on the moon, figured that out. He was one of the first ones. He's the first guy that ever did that. And, um, and it, it's, you know, water's viscous. You've got to work against the water. So it's hard to start, easy to stop. In space, it's easy to start and hard to stop, you know, so it's a little bit different. And um, 
that's the best way to train. So those, the training, I think, uh, in those aspects were probably the most enjoyable part of the of hardest, but also most enjoyable part about being an astronaut. 